And it sort of culminated, uh, well, going on about 15 years of research uh, from a variety of, uh, of things that I've worked on and with other people and uh, some, some of it going all the way back to the Storm Prediction Center, a lot of it occurring here in the last 10 years at Jackson and uh, at the Milwaukee office. So I want to kind of share something where it's my, something where we look and try to pull together a lot of the parameters that we look at every time for significant severe and specifically for tornadic supercells, which of course would also include very large hail events in many cases. So I'll, what we're going to talk about today uh, is again some of the research and development that went into this, uh, the parameters that are involved in this particular uh, aggregate parameter, how things are scored, uh, some verification that I've done in the last year on it, uh, give you about 10 examples from events, and then take you through a, ten, a sample 10-day ten uh, forecast process uh, and show how it could have some utility as a day four to eight forecast tool. So one thing when, when in, in Jackson, Mississippi, especially when I worked down there after leaving the Storm Prediction Center, I started to see what I call 576 magic. We used to have a magic chart way back for snow with the NGM and it kind of reminded me of, of that, that a lot of big tornado days were centered somewhere near the 576 decameter height contour at 500 millibars. And that, I decided to expand that to more than just one parameter, but to kind of go back through a lot of the work dating back to Fawbush and Miller back in the 50s and expanding it through modern time. I want, a, I want a way to quantify the potential risk uh, it, ra rather than looking you know, at, at any one parameter like cape or shear, I'd like to bring it all together and really get a feel for how high the risk is for significant tornadoes. What I did is expand it again to 35 total parameters and locally I call it CWAS, which stands for Craven Wiedenfeld Aggregate Severe Parameter. Uh, I was trying to think of I, WAS would probably be a, a better description since Jerry did most of the work. So, uh, but anyhow, that's another story. The uh, the six year study that I did. Uh, it's funny how. Sometimes you end up doing things that are being done concurrently elsewhere. Well, I spent uh, quite a bit of time collecting data from strong and violent tornado events from 2000 to 2005. And then I, I was excited and I was sharing the work with Rich Thompson about three years ago at SPC. And he says, well, we already did that, Craven, um, which, of course, the nice thing about this is it is been, has been published. Uh, there's um, uh, Grams et al. 2011. I think they focused a lot on RUC data, and I always focus on observed data, particularly zero Z soundings. So I collected over 200 events from in the six-year period from 2000 to 2005. Most of the time, it's zero Z upper data, upper air data analysis. And I'd look at the location of the biggest tornado and would lean heavily towards the nearest sounding analysis. So the proximity is a little bit fuzzy. In the past, I've used 100 kilometers and plus or minus three hours. In, I, in general, I did that with this data set, but I, I wouldn't be able to promise every one of them meets that criteria. And as it turned out during that period, Roughly 40% of the events were from the cold season and 60% from the warm season. Uh, I, I will point out later what, what my definition is. It's basically 
in a nutshell, it's basically April 1st to October 1st is warm season. I'd like you to key on this uh, italics line. I'm not advocating re using this to replace detailed near storm environment analysis. Uh, that's always going to be key, particularly uh, on the first day. This is more of a general forecast parameter, particularly for further out, to give a general idea of threat. Also, I have another data set that I collected when I was back at the end of my SPC career and early on in the, when I was at Jackson, worked on it more since I've been here, have a 40-year data set for EF2 tornado events. These are all just sounding parameters. And it's interesting that when you break out those events, uh, there's about 1,200. And there's a lot more in the warm season than in the cold season. And as it turns out, uh, there's a article by Potvin et al. that used this uh, just a couple of years ago. Steve Weiss is one of the co-authors from SPC that uh, used this data set and, and looked at what they called the Goldilocks zone, which is, you know, my data set went from zero to, say, 100, 100 nautical miles, and they found that there's actually a sweet spot that's not too close and not too far from the tornado that gives you a better idea of the threat. Again, here, this is all observed data. There's no RUC or model data set. So it's kind of complementary to a lot of the work that Thompson and Edwards and, and others like John Davies have done, but it, it's all observed soundings, which, which of course, have limitations as well. Uh, they're not always uh, in the right spot at the right time, if you will. Again, here's our cold and warm season definition. So how do we assign a CWAS score? Well, uh, I heavily use box and whisker plots to, in order to assign these scores. For a particular parameter, three is the highest score. And typically, it would be assigned when a parameter is in the middle 50 or between the 25th and 70th. Uh, fifth percentile. As you get further out, you get lower scores. So the 10th to 25th or the 75th to 90th get to 2. Uh, the, min, the one score of 1 is if you're between the min of the data set and the 10th or the 90th and the max. And I'll show all this visually in a second. So everything outside of that would typically get 0 points. There are some exceptions because just because the Cape has never been above 4,000 for what, for example, uh, if in my data set, I wouldn't necessarily give that zero points. It doesn't make sense. So some of the parameters, basically, the higher it gets, the more points you get. So it's not, uh, I'll show you an example with 500 millibar heights, how I do this. If, so here's an example from the six-year data set. And again, there's about 220, sample size is about 220. So to get three points, you'd have to be in this middle 50 between about 570 and 579. And again, 570, this is why I call it 576 magic. The median of the data set is 575 uh, year-round. As you get a little bit further away from this middle 50, you get two points up here and down there. And then again, from the min and max of the data set, you get one point. And outside of this, above 590 heights, at least for this one parameter, and below 552, you'd get zero. As, uh, as I've been looking at this, something that I've uh, Jerry and I are working on currently, but that I won't have any information on in this talk other than this slide, is that there are some seasonal variations. Some parameters, like surface pressure, look the same year-round. There's others, like 500 height, that vary a little bit. And as you might expect, they're a little bit lower in the cold season. 
And that's something that we're going to investigate. Uh, but that's all I'll say about seasonal variation at this point. So the 35 parameters that are included, uh, we'll quickly run them down. Uh, surface pressure and pressure fall. And then from the first, from the surface, the 850 height, 700 height, 500 height, basic, very similar uh, temperature dew point for each of these, Not uh, no dew point for 500. Uh, low level wind directions uh, at surface at 850, wind speeds at all these levels all the way up to 250, and then we also use 1,000 to 5 thickness. Uh, there's a both low level shear and deep layer shear. The wet bulb zero height, obviously, is not a big factor for tornadoes, but I threw it in there since it's been used since the Fawbush and Miller days. Uh, easy to calculate. Uh, certainly would help with large hail. Then there's a bunch of uh, uh, instability uh, type products. Uh, mean 100 millibar mean layer cape. 100 millibar mean layer sin, LCL height using that same layer, surface-based LI, and then Showalter. And we have the 7 to 5 lapse rate, a K index, a little bit of duplication here. The significant severe parameter, of course, is simply this ML cape times that 0 to 6 shear. So it kind of weights that a little bit heavier. The uh, mid-level storm relative wind using the bunker's right mover motion uh, to capture some of the work uh, on storm relative flow weaknesses at mid-levels per Rich Thompson. And then downdraft cape and low-level cape. So that's the 35 parameters in a nutshell. To kind of give you a breakdown of how, how that represents in the spectrum of how of these, and, and again, this is in no way to, you know, to, this is not how I planned it. It just sort of came out this way, and I just wanted to share. The sample size is on the bottom in red, so 10 of the 35 parameters have something to do with wind, speed, direction, or vertical wind shear. Uh, nine of them are about 26% instability, something to do with pressure or heights, or pressure change or height change. Uh, there's six parameters, temperature and moisture round them out. And obviously, instability, temperature, and moisture are interrelated, so there is some uh, dependence. I got a little error message that popped up. Can everyone still see my screen? Yes, I see it here at Central. Do you see how CWASP is scored? because I got a red banner that popped up saying that screen sharing is paused. We can see it. OK, just want to make sure. So now you go to all those 35 parameters, and you add up the score between 0 and 3 for all, all the 35, and divide by 105, so it comes out in a percentage from 0 to 100. Keep in mind, each parameter is equally weighted in this case. so. A uh, 500 temperature carries the same weight as an ML cape in this case. At least for the parameter averaged year-round, we've seen scores as high as 85. Like uh, the other day, uh, there were in Kansas and Oklahoma, there were 85s for the, uh, the 14th uh, outbreak. And uh, 70, but seeing 75% or higher is not particularly common and should get your attention. So after designing this, uh, we've been running this in AWIPS uh, since the middle of last April. So I've got about a year of data. And I'm con I stopped for the purpose of this talk on the 31st, but I plan on continuing to collect data uh, into the summer. All, now, th th this is a conditional study uh, based on having one severe report. So any day there was a severe report, I took a look at over this year period 
it just could be one or it could be 500 or 1,000 reports, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. If we had multiple severe reports, I looked at the location of the strongest tornado. If there weren't any tornadoes, I looked at the most significant severe report, basically in a simplistic form, what was the largest hail report or the highest wind report if, if, there, if we had actual speeds. And during this last year, I looked at 12, 36, 60 and 84 hour forecast. So essentially uh, what the 12Z forecast looked at on day one, two, three, and four. And in most cases, the data I collected was for zero Z. Just to kind of give you a summary, that ended up with 196 cases. Uh, and these are individual days, which is a case. Here's your maximum amount of severe reports, medians, and averages. So for the median, a typical event had over 50 reports and one tornado of roughly EF1 scale. And typically, hail was up around 2 inches in diameter in the, in the largest case. Um, wind. Wind events tend to be more common in the data set than hail reports. So here's the distribution. And when I say observed day one value, that's actually an average. Uh, the average is actually the average at the point of the most significant severe uh, of the NAM, the GFS, and the European scores. So it's not really a single model score, it's kind of an ensemble score. And, but the maximum that you see is the maximum value at any point within a state or two of the most significant severe uh, on any of the models. And you notice there's a slight difference in these distributions. Uh, as the score gets up, around 40, 50, 60 percent, most of the events uh, with severe had values at the point of the most significant severe, somewhere in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, and then they drop off. But notice that the maximum value within a state or two of the, of the significant event actually maximizes up around uh, 70% or so. So to really, it, most of the time, my attention isn't captured very much with this parameter until it, there's some 60% some or higher showing up. This is a uh, distribution a box and whisker of the 196 day, uh, severe days, what the uh, CWA score was the average of the three models on day one, so basically a 12-hour forecast for, uh, for the point where the strongest tornado or most significant severe event occurred. And again, most, most of the time you're up in the 50s or 60s. Uh, so that's, that's where I, my attention starts to get. The average value for the models so far hasn't exceeded 80 at the point uh, where, because the set, and if you think about the scoring, if you get a, a score of one for all 35 parameters, you'd get a 33%. If you got a score of two for all parameters, it would be 66. And if you had all twos and threes uh, for the parameter, you'd have a score of 83 just as an example. And here's the max values, again, somewhere nearby, but usually south and east of where the significant event occurs. Uh, you have scores mostly in the 60s or higher. As far as tracking the changes from day one to four, uh, due to uncertainty of models and placement issues, as you would expect, where the event occurred on day four, 
the scores were a little bit lower and tended to ramp up and, and were higher on day one. And again, this is the mean value for the whole for all 196 severe events. And the mean value for the maximum was about 66. So again, until I start seeing values over 60, typically the interest level isn't particularly high. Again, this is for all severe events, not just tornadoes. And I've talked about the, the difference between the average CWASP and the maximum value. And I'll show you some charts later that kind of visually describe that. So again, looking at day one uh, uh, values for all these events, of the 196 day events, so severe days, 40 of them had strong tornadoes, 77 had uh, EF zeros or EF ones, and 79 had uh, no tornado reports anywhere in the U.S. Keep in mind, I would expect. You know, I, I don't I haven't looked at, at a climatology of se severe days and the percentage of days that have tornadoes. Last year was kind of ridiculously active for tornadoes, so normally I wouldn't expect 60% of the severe days in a year period to have tornadoes. And again, a non-tornado day for this example means that there were severe reports but no tornadoes reported. You'll notice that there's as the val as as you get more and more significant severe the value does go up. There's also an interesting difference of roughly 10% between the average of the day one models at the point where the most significant severe occurred and the max value somewhere nearby, a lot of the cases, the big event was in the gradient area north and west of the maximum um, by roughly about one to two county warning areas. And that's just kind of subjective. So let's look at some distributions of CWAS values. Uh, and again, these are averages for day one, and then versus the number of severe reports for those 196 events. Along the bottom is the number of events, so one to nine severe events. Over here on the right would be days with, and 5% of the days had more than 500 severe reports across the US. The uh, sample size of each one of these is across the bottom. It's interesting to note that the mode is, 20, is one to nine reports, but the next highest frequency out of those 196 report days was 100 to 249, which again probably reflects how significant the severe season was last year. I, I wouldn't actually, I'd have to go back and look at what typical distributions are, but I wouldn't expect it to jump that much. It's quite interesting. Anyhow, the convention again is the maximum CWAS value anywhere nearby is in red, and this will continue for all the graphs I show. And the average is where the most significant report occurred, and it's an average of the three models. So you notice there is some there's moderate correlation, and, and I'm defining the significance of the correlation as 0.2 to 0.4 would be weak, 0.4 to 0.7 would be moderate, and 0.7 or higher would be fairly high correlation. Very high is typically 90.9. So there's some moderate correlation, and again, you can see in general as the number of reports goes up, the uh, CWAS values also go up. And there tends to be about a 10, 10 unit spread between the location of the most significant severe and the max. Now, this is just for tornadoes. Uh, the correlation is weaker. Uh, it's only 0.367. But 
as the value goes up, there's some correlation between the number of tornadoes and the CWAS value. Notice, again, this is the sample size. So uh, when there was tornadoes, um, Usually, most of the time, there was only one to nine tornadoes on a given day. Obviously, in the old days, the tornado outbreak was defined by 10 or more tornadoes occurring in an event. Uh, I think our standards are much higher, and I, I'd be curious uh, with the inflation of reports what we would use anymore. Typically, when I was at SPC, 20 or more tornadoes started to become kind of outbreakish. Maybe now it's going to have to be even higher. Again, you see a, a nice increase, but there is fairly weak correlation, so it's not a, a strong, strong signal. Now going up to strong tornadoes, which would be EF2, 3, 4, 5, or greater, and the correlation actually gets weaker, which is, is interesting since this is designed off of a strong tornado database but yet the correlation is actually weaker. So one of the reasons why I didn't call it an aggregate tornado parameter and I call it an aggregate severe parameter is it seems to do better at just predicting severe than tornadoes, but that, that uh, result is largely expected. I, I wouldn't have expected to solve all our tornado forecasting problems with this technique, but there is weak correlation. Uh, the values tend to be, in most cases, in the 70s for the max. So you get 70s or greater, and that's probably the most useful output is the events that didn't have any strong tornadoes, which were 66% of the events, generally you're talking about values below 70. And as you increase into the 70s, uh, you get not only better chance of uh, strong tornadoes, but a better chance of multiple strong tornadoes. Then I looked at EF scale, which is similar to the other, but basically splitting things out to each of, you know, either there weren't any tornadoes or this was the highest scale observed. And the correlation jumps back up to moderate again. In fact, it's the highest correlation of anything that I did, but obviously it's not you know, it's, it's only approaching 0.5, but um, I'd like to see it higher than that. But there does seem to be some skill that the higher the value, uh, the better the better chance that uh, you'll see strong or violent tornadoes. Again, the maximum value the other day in uh, Oklahoma, Kansas was 85, uh, and there was an EF4 in central Kansas, which would, would have been within one or two CWAs of the maximum. Conditional probability. And now when I show all these conditional probabilities, the condition is that given a severe report and a CWAS score, this is the probability of a tornado or a strong tornado. So the condition... And as I'll talk in the summary, uh, there's been no consideration for salt, false alarms, and that's work that needs, that, that's next on the to-do list, is to do a climatology and to come up with some sense of false alarm rate. Anyhow, uh, looking at the, this is the day one average sea wasp at the location of the, of the tornado report, or most significant. Notice that until you jump into the 50s and especially 60s, the probabilities don't get particularly high, especially for strong tornadoes. So uh, once you get above 60, and of course you would have to know in advance where along the 60 gradient that the tornado would occur to, or where the report's going to occur in relation to the values, but you do have fairly high probabilities given a severe report of at least one tornado. And above 70, you're talking about uh, very high probabilities up in the 60s. Keep in mind that I'm trying to use this red uh, probability of EF2 plus as kind of a 
uh, comparison to the 10% hatched area that SPC often puts into their outlooks, you can see that there may be some utility in, in, in using that uh, for, with this parameter. Now, looking at the maximum CWAS value, the, the previous slide was the average. This is the maximum anywhere on the uh, chart. Using the other day when we had 85 show up in Oklahoma, Kansas, there was a there would have been an 80 percent probability of a tornado and a 60 percent chance that it would be strong or violent. It's interesting to note that the next day, uh, over where we had the moderate risk over Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, the models had initially been showing values up around 70, but then at the last minute they dropped very rapidly into the 50s and 60s. There were tornadoes in Minnesota, but the event was largely uh, a little bit overdone. But uh, there were, it's interesting, there were, we may call it a failure, but there was actually 16 tornado reports across the nation that day. So um, it's, it's hard to know if that's truly a false alarm. So I'll show you some 10 examples of, of of what these charts look like in AWIPS from the past year. Um, there's some various seasons and geographical areas mixed in here. So we'll get back to some of the real nasty events last year. This is the day before the Tuscaloosa tornado and the, uh, the really big death tolls that we had in Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, and some of the other sites. Here's the zero Z uh, chart with reports. I believe the way AWIPS does this is the reports are wrapped within three hours either side of, so this would probably be 21 to three Z, the uh, reports, and I may be wrong on that. That's just a guess. This is a, this blue contour is 80% or higher. Purple is 70% or higher. White is 60. And these color codes, in general, are the same throughout the presentation. So 50% I highlighted as red, 60 white, and then 70, 80. So again, until you start getting above 50, generally your interest level shouldn't be particularly high. Notice that at this time, the maximum is near Jackson, Mississippi. The severe event is off in the gradient area to the northwest. Here, actually, I'm going to show you every 12, six hours because the event just seemed to continue for on and on. Here at 6C, the parameter is still above 70%, and here's the tornado reports, and even at 6Z the day before, there were there was an EF3 in Mississippi and there were some deaths overnight. Here is 12Z the next morning, and again, there was a fairly significant morning event in Alabama. There's a maximum around 70 to 75 back here, and, and then 70s extend all the way up towards the Tennessee border see these tornado reports. There was actually, I believe there was an EF4 somewhere in here, even in the morning. Here's 18Z when the second event started to really ramp up. There's an 80% maximum near Huntsville, large 70% area. Tornadoes spread out all through here. You also notice there's some 60s and 70s way up into New York. Keep in mind that even though it's kind of forgotten, there were strong tornadoes in New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia. There might have even been the F4 in Virginia. You know, this whole area here would have been a big outbreak had it not been overshadowed by what happened down here. So you can see by 0Z, large area over 60%, pockets of 70 up in here. And uh, so that's the forgotten part of that outbreak. You notice by 0Z, the maximum of 80% has moved into North Carolina, and but there's 70s hanging all the way back, tornadoes pretty much all over the place. So let's look at a different event, not quite as 
uh, significant. There's um, this is a June 1st when there was tornado, strong tornado EF3 near Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, here's a 70% area centered pretty much where the the biggest event occurred. There's also some tornadoes out in Kansas. There's a little pinhead 70% large area of 60 to 65 percent uh, out here. Going to another event in November for southwest Oklahoma, 80 percent centered near Wichita Falls. The tornado, uh, EF4 tornado occurred in southwest Oklahoma. Here is uh, this, the leap year outbreak uh, started the night before. This is at 6Z. The maximum down in the Ozarks, EF2 tornado in Branson. Later on, there would be an EF4 in southern Illinois. Notice that uh, values at 12Z are, are a lot lower. Again, the index was designed for 0Z, but you're on this gradient area up just to the north of the max. Here is uh, March 2nd. At 18Z, there was uh, right around this time EF3s at Huntsville. This is a 77 and a half max over northern Alabama. The gradient area up to the north uh, near the surface low, there's an EF4 in Indiana. And as you move forward, had maximums up in the 80s. Uh, the bigger the storms occurred up in Kentucky. There was an EF3 up here in the gradient. Uh, but there were uh, EF2s uh, down in this part of Alabama and Mississippi. Just the coverage wasn't quite as significant. Here's a couple more examples as we get ready to wrap up. This is uh, the 18th of March, uh, the day before the uh, San Antonio area tornadoes, large 70% area. Uh, there's a pinhead 80 here in northwest Texas. 70s extend all the way up into Nebraska. And in this gradient area, there's a North Platte EF3. Tornadoes actually eventually snuck up all the way to the South Dakota-Nebraska border. It's another cluster of severe storms and tornadoes southwest Oklahoma. The next day, 80% area uh, near the Hill Country, uh, pretty good severe, including some significant hail. And the, the strongest tornadoes in the San Antonio CWA in the last five years, uh, some EF2s occurred just southwest of there. Next day, a little bit weaker. Uh, maximum in the mid-60s, off in the gradient area to the northwest, uh, several tornadoes, including an EF1. And here's another example of a, of a more, a little bit more minor event. Uh, from the 28th of March, there was uh, some very large hail and one brief tornado in this small little maximum uh, here over Kansas. So. What I want to show you now is what kind of predictability there is in the extended. Um, my personal feeling is that SPC has designed a product that is a little bit too, a little bit too high scale. They have a they, you need a thirty percent probability to issue day four to eight outlooks. Well, as you know, thirty percent areas are rarely done on days two and three in some cases. They do occasionally issue one. There is one out today for uh, Florida for that closed low that's going to come across. You, you see a few on day four and five. It's pretty rare to see day six and seven. I, I haven't seen a day eight that I know of. So with that in mind, for putting severe potential in the HWOs, WFOs are typically on their own. Again, this is my opinion. So I wanted to show you an example, and I have several other examples like this from that March 19th event, San Antonio area. So if we start out on day 10, which is before SPC even issues outlooks, 
the GFS on the left and the European on the right, keep in mind the purples are 70 percent or higher and 80s or higher or in light blue. The tornadoes occurred down in here, so the utility of this may not be necessarily to pinpoint it 10 days out or even four days out, but to me there is already a signal of consistency between the models that something interesting could happen. Notice that there was severe and even a tornado up in Minnesota. So day 10, there's some signal there. You go to the next day, day 9, still a signal. It's a little bit further west from the area of interest, but as you can see, the event actually occurred uh, back in here. You know, so it was a little bit fast, but this is nine days out. You go to day eight, uh, the forecast is predictability too low. I see fairly strong signal from South Dakota into Central Texas. In that case, it would have been a little bit, if you had outlooked on the gradient, you would have been off by, say, half a state or so. Go to day seven. You start to see a shift where the probabilities drop in the north and increase down south. Still nothing from SPC. Day six, uh, SPC issues an outlook uh, out to the west. And again, keep in mind there was tornadoes on day five, southwest Oklahoma and North Platte, so they did a good job. But they're still not out looking on day six. This is not really valid for that day. You'll see the next day they add one. Notice now that Texas is starting to really get focused near the hill country. You got a 90%, which is that's the highest values that I can recall uh, this forecasting here in the hill country. The next day the outlook is added from the hill country up into Kansas. So they did un indeed add one for day five. You see it's still hitting down here in the hill country. Does it again on day four. Day three, you get some 85% showing up. You see the NAMS got 85%, pretty much right where the tornadoes occurred. Day two, a uh, fairly similar signal. Day one, notice that SPC had hatched, decided not to put hatch tornadoes, had the 10% uh, area shifted a little further north. Um, they did have hatched for hail and wind, I believe. So doing a summary here, uh, I think that CWAS does show some skill at predicting strong tornadoes and large severe weather report days. I do think it adds an e it ha provides an easy way to rank and quantify the risk. Um, because I collected these parameters from a course data set, which is synoptic scale data, the course models do show some skill at least out to day four and five at predicting these events. And it's not well calibrated, but in general, once you see CWAS values above 40 percent, if severe weather occurs, the probability of at least one tornado uh, is roughly equivalent to the CWAS value. Some more summary. If there's a severe report, again, conditional on a severe report, once you see CWAS above 70 percent, you start getting fairly high conditional probabilities of strong tornadoes. And I, again, I'm thinking hatched. Hatched is 10 percent on SPC outlooks. This when you get above 70 for this data set, you're getting like a 20% conditional probability of strong tornadoes. There seems to be a weak to moderate correlation between the max value of CWASP and the number of severe reports, tornadoes, and the EF scale. The maximum value, which was, this, this is a little disappointing, the maximum value doesn't seem to consistently highlight the location of the risk. 
that was my hope, is to actually have it highlight the location. But as is true in so many severe weather parameters, uh, the gradient area north and west of the maximum seems to be, and again, it's dependent on flow. That's assuming you have a southwest flow regime, which is pretty typical. It seems to be in the gradient area. I have not evaluated false alarm ratio. Uh, I'm hoping to work with St. Louis University, who's working with the SIPS analogs folks, to have them uh, look at the NARR, the North American Regional Reanalysis data, and do a climatology of this parameter and come up with an idea of false alarm rate. That's all I have. I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any questions for our speaker today? Hi, it's Carl in Des Moines. Hi, Carl. Good work. Lots into that, obviously. We're kind of wondering, you know, you have a lot of parameters in there. Would an attempt to go through some sort of regression to throw out maybe the five or ten that have the kind of least correlation help this number to bump up and be even a lot better? Absolutely. And if I were smart enough, I would be able to do that. Um, smart enough to help you. <laughs> <laughs> I would I think that I think that that would be an excellent idea. I think that that certainly certainly could uh, we could even consider weightings and whatnot. But it's funny how equally weighting the 35 parameters seems to have some some skill. So yeah, I I certainly think this is just the beginning. So I look look forward to opportunities with smart people to that can do that kind of analysis uh, for us to to sharpen this up even further. Hey Jeff, uh, this is Pete. Uh, you mentioned there was a similar study uh, published on that. How, how different are the two? And have you compared the results of the two? Well, the, the one thing about the other, the, the short answer is not really. But, but what little I have compared, they did a lot of work with convective mode. So they looked at the parameters and looked at convective mode for their uh, to look at severe potential, particularly strong tornado potential, and they used rock. Uh, mo I I was trying to develop something that you know, since predicting mode on day seven is just about impossible. Since we have trouble on day one a lot of times, I I just wanted something that was independent of that kind of classification. So all I did is. So some of these strong tornadoes could have been QLCS tornadoes. I didn't specifically look at supercells like many, many of the Edwards and Thompson studies to weed out the QLCS. So this could be, you know, and I would, but I'd have to go back and actually look at what percentage of my strong tornadoes uh, in the database were QLCS. I, I don't have an answer to that. And that's something that they specifically outlined in their study. So that's they. I probably should have said no. <laughs> yeah, well, no. I, I, that's good to know the the real differences there. I, uh, thanks. Looks great. Hey Jeff, can you share the uh, AWIPS code? Uh, I could. <laughs> Jerry, are you listening? The, the problem with the code, and I don't want to go into the same room as Jerry because the feedback from they have the speaker on out and there, I'll, I'll get dizzy. Um, yes, I'm here. Yeah, the code, it, it, it takes a lot of work. Let's just put it that way. And in fact, as, as Dan, you know, Dan's a volume browser, Dan Baumgard guru, it, you have to actually get rid of some parameters because you reach, when you put in all these parameters, you reach a limit 
uh, and it causes all kinds of problems. So we didn't, we're not sure whether this is worth going into AWIPS 1 or if we should shoot for AWIPS 2, but I'll let Jerry describe. Uh, it, 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 does, it, it does require a lot of work. Go ahead, Jerry. Well, I mean, Jeff basically answered the problem. It's a, it's a problem with the virtual field table, to be specific. Um, it, it, it requires basically 37 new parameters to put into it. So you end up running into a lot of indexing issues if you already have, like, say, Dan ba Baumgarten's volume browser. Um, it is already getting close to the max variable limit. So I'm sure there's better ways to program it. I did it a fairly simple way. But, yeah, I mean, it, that Jeff hit it on the head. We're trying to decide whether or not it's an AWIPS 2 or an AWIPS 1 type thing. But if you want, I can... I have install instructions written, so if you want it, just let me know and I can try to help you work through it. Yeah, the instructions are out there. there some, Jerry, how many offices have actually installed it? Because I know we've given it to people and then they, they, they a lot of them got frustrated and gave up on it. <laughs> it said, Jeff, sounds to me like this is a candidate for post-process field from models. Well, I would think so. That's why I'm not. And, and, and as I think it's it's really in its infant stages, but I I I think it has promise, and there's probably parameters in there, as Carl says, that we don't need, and there's some parameters that we probably do need that aren't in there, and there because also there's issues of waiting, I mean, even you know besides removing some parameters, there may be. Uh, situations where we want to wait certain ones higher but yeah I, I agree with you I'm try I've been kind of been trying to uh, lure uh, SPC into doing some of this on the meso analysis page and the uh, Chuck Graves at SLU is going to try to incorporate it into the analog site and see how it works but um, yeah it, it the way we're doing it is is kind of a kludge, I would say. I don't want to say that about Jerry's work, but because I'm really happy he did it, but it, there's probably better ways to do it. Hey Jeff, this is yeah. Pat down of Paducah. Um, would you consider maybe trying to put the, post this stuff up on a website then, if, if we can't process it in AWIPS? I. I, you know, we can. I, I have four panels that I haven't shown. I didn't show any here, but I'm generating four panels of of four models, including the Gem Northern Hemisphere, uh, that would be pretty easy to share. In fact, I sometimes I email them out and whatnot. But if they're maybe we can find out a way to to generate them and and post them somewhere. But they're they're fairly a nice thing. They're fairly easy to look at, and the idea is, if you see my view on these things, is narrow the threat, or, or it's kind of like, hello, we've got a threat here, and then start looking at other stuff. So, yeah, I, I'll I'll look into that, Pat. Thanks. Anything else? Well, again, I I appreciate it, and if 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 any of you want to, you know, Jerry, I, I we can send out the instructions to the Sioux list, and if you guys want to take a look at it, uh, I know it's timing is awkward with AWIPS too, um, but it it's been it's been pretty helpful, and it seems to. Since it's designed from a national data set, it, it seems to be work pretty well just about anywhere. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to any other comments. Feel free to – I'm going to write this up for the NWA conference, and then, and then obviously there's lots more work to do on it. Well, uh, th thank you, Jeff and Jim. All right, thanks everybody, take care.
Have a good day. We'll have the recording up shortly.